Okay, we'll get started. So today what we're going to do is we are going to talk about charged black holes. Okay, so if you recall, uh, when we talked about the no hair theorem, we said that black holes, once they reach steady state, have very few properties that actually describe them. Okay, and those properties are uh, the mass, the spin, and any possible charge, either electric charge, which we denote as Q, or magnetic charge, which we denote as P. And that's it. That's a short list of all the properties. Uh, this might be extended if we discover new long range forces in nature. At the moment, the only long range force we know, is, besides gravity, is the electri electromagnetic force, okay, because the photons are massless force carriers. Every other force that we know of, okay, is short range, the weak force and the strong force. So if you have more long range forces, then it's possible that black holes may have more such charges, okay. But the Noah theorem generally tells us that the black hole is described by very few simple properties. So we've already seen that black holes can be described by a mass, okay. So today what we're going to do is we're going to see that black holes can also be described by charges, okay. So a combination of mass and charges. So we'll find a different type of solution to not just Einstein's equation, but rather Einstein-Maxwell equations, which include the equations of electromagnetism, okay. And in the next class, we'll also look at black holes with angular momentum, okay. So uh, now that we've defined what we mean by a charge, mass and spin as something that we can measure from very far away from a black hole. Okay, we are going to define the so-called charged black holes which are also called uh, Reisner Nordstrom black holes. Okay, and uh, as I mentioned, we are going to look for solutions to the coupled Einstein Maxwell equations. Okay. So when I say Einstein Maxwell equations, what I mean is we imagine that there is an action for this theory. The action is described by a metric and it's also described by electric and magnetic fields which I can write in terms of the vector potential a mu, okay, which is uh, a vector potential, okay. And uh, it, there might also be other fields. For example, there might be particles which carry charge under electromagnetism and of course everything is coupled to gravity, okay, so it's also, also gravity. So this could be like an electron field or so on. And we write down an action for them, okay, and this action will involve the gravitational Einstein-Hilbert action, okay, which is square root minus g times R uh, times the standard volume element plus the free Maxwell source term, okay, which uh, which looks something like this, minus one fourth F mu nu, F mu nu uh, times, again, the square root of minus G times E. And then there will be source terms which source the electromagnetic current and those sources could be some kind of scalar field or some fermionic field like electrons. And quite generally, okay, the source terms will have their own, so let me write it like this, S source kinetic, which I'm not going to write down. So this will involve the dynamics of that scalar field, but rather we'll think of these sources as some kind of classical source and we'll write down the coupling uh, to electromagnetism, okay, and that coupling will look like this. There will be uh, a term which looks like G mu, A mu, okay. So the kinetic term will also involve the metric because almost every term in general will involve the metric, okay. So the coupling to gravity will be present here, but it will also be present here. Then the, but the coupling to electromagnetism, that is how the source interacts with the electromagnetic field is encoded in this term in the Lagrangian, where J mu is a conserved current that is constructed from the source fields, okay. So this J mu satisfies this property, 
okay so sorry first first thing is now we have to take the equations of motion and we take the equations of motion we take the equation of motion with respect to g we take the equation of motion with respect to a okay and we should also take the equations of motion with respect to phi okay and this phi is this gmu is some functional of phi okay what i'm going to do is i'm not going to take the equations of motion of phi i'll just write down for a generic gmu which is constructed from phi i'll just write down these two equations the metric that the equation of motion that i get when i vary with respect to the metric and the equation of motion that i get when i vary with respect to a okay so when i do this uh, what i get for the equation of motion is of course when i vary with respect to the metric we just get from the einstein hilbert term we just get g mu nu is equal to 8 pi g t mu nu where t mu nu is the stress energy tensor now what is the stress energy tensor well we've written down an expression for it before so t mu nu is minus 1 over 8 pi square root minus g delta s matter by delta g okay so everything other than the einstein hilbert term is the matter uh, action okay and this matter action has to be varied to find the stress energy tensor so the stress energy tensor gets contributions from here gets contributions from here and gets contributions from here okay and so i can i can in fact write it as a sum of three terms p uh, maxwell plus t uh, interaction plus t of other fields like phi okay so uh, uh, corresponding to these three terms over here each part will give me a separate contribution okay for the stress energy tensor and if i write down the equation of motion with respect to a i end up getting maxwell's equations uh, actually you, what you get is only the source maxwell's equations which is del mu f mu nu is uh sorry is equal to j nu okay where this j nu is the same j nu that so shows up here uh, let me write this as small j okay which is the electromagnetic current which depends on the field phi okay so j mu is some function i'm just assuming is some function of phi okay and you also have some equation of motion for phi maybe it's some kind of klein gordon field okay uh, we we're not really going to worry about that now you might ask what happens to the other maxwell's equations okay which so this is the source maxwell's equations uh, what about the source free maxwell's equations well it turns out that you get them for free because the fact that f mu nu so what in this action you're actually not treating f mu nu as an independent field you're writing f mu nu in terms of a as this okay so this is the definition of what we're using for f mu nu and uh, so once you write down this then it's automatic that del rho f mu nu epsilon rho mu nu sigma is zero okay so the moment you write down a vector potential okay which you assume is valid everywhere uh, or wherever the vector potential is valid this equation is automatically satisfied okay so once this is automatically satisfied okay this is uh, since this is automatically satisfied we can just write it down as an equation okay which is in short it's del mu f twiddle mu nu is zero okay and to be more specific this is the electric current okay and this is the electric current which is up over here okay if i have magnetic charges okay in my theory then there will be a modification of this equation okay this is if there are no magnetic charges no magnetic monopoles okay but if i have magnetic monopoles then i would write down an equation which looks like j mu magnetic okay which would be constructed from uh, possibly some other degrees of freedom maybe phi itself if phi has magnetic charge okay where this f twiddle mu nu is epsilon mu nu rho sigma uh f rho sigma. okay i'm i'm being a little bit sloppy because uh i have not really carefully defined epsilon 
ok. Uh, in fact, this I am assuming let us say in uh, uh, yeah I have to be a little more precise, but let us just say with this with the standard lowered indices in Cartesian coordinates we will assume that this is fully anti-symmetric that is it is either plus 1 if mu equals uh, mu nu rho sigma is 0 1 2 3 and cyclic permutations thereof and minus 1 for anti-symmetric permutations ok. And so if I raise the indices of mu nu rho sigma I have to raise them using the metric ok and uh, uh, yeah uh, ok. So that, that's all I'll say about this. Uh, maybe we can discuss it in more detail later. Uh, one aside that I'll point out is uh, there is no way to actually get this. Since this equation kind of came to us automatically because we assume that this action is a functional of a mu rather than f itself, we are assuming the existence of a mu already. Okay, which means we're assuming the existence of no magnetic monopoles, at least in the regions where we assume that this action is correct. Okay. Uh, or no magnetic sources. If you have magnetic sources, okay, there is no way to write down an equation, okay, which uh, or a Lagrangian which simultaneously describes electric and magnetic sources that is also local and Lorentz invariant, uh, sorry, um, not Lorentz invariant, but um, uh, diffeomorphism invariant in this case, okay. So there is no way to write down uh, such an action. But we will assume that ok at the level of the equations of motion rather than just the action principle you can write down ok you can add magnetic sources as well. Ok so now let us be clear what we are looking for when we say we are looking for charged black holes. So similar to Schwarzschild we will be looking for black holes where there is no matter ok it is vacuum almost vacuum except for one thing since our black holes have charge either electric or magnetic if I am far away there will be electric and magnetic fields sourced by the black hole itself ok. Which means that I am allowed to have at long distances ok far away from the black hole uh, I will assume that this is non-zero. So I will assume f mu nu is non-zero far from the black hole ok. But we will assume that j mu everywhere is zero that is there are no sources anywhere ok. The black hole itself might carry charge and maybe some other charge is hidden at the singularity. So we are solving consistently in vacuum ok. So we will set these source terms to 0, j mu electric to 0, j mu magnetic to 0 ok. And we will solve these equations in the absence of charge sources. So therefore even these terms disappear ok. There is no T mu nu interaction, there is no T mu nu phi because you have turned off all your source, uh, other sources ok. So the only thing that is present and that contributes to the stress energy tensor is the Maxwell fields. So the important point is that even if you have electric magnetic fields coming out of the black hole, these electric magnetic fields gravitate and therefore they will alter the metric ok. So the metric will respond to the fact that you have these electric and magnetic fields at long distances ok. So it would not be a Schwarzschild metric at long distances you will get some other kind of metric ok and that will be this Reisner Nordstrom metric ok. So the first thing to do is we have to write down what is this T mu nu ok. So we will write down T mu nu Maxwell uh, which looks something like this F mu rho F nu rho minus one fourth G mu nu uh, f rho sigma, f rho sigma. Okay. This you can work out for yourself by using this definition of t mu nu and apply it to that Maxwell term that we wrote down. Okay, so what are we looking for? We are looking for a rotationally symmetric solutions, just as with Schwarzschild. to the source free or charge source free Einstein Maxwell equations. Ok. 
okay, which is g mu nu is 8 pi g n, uh, t mu nu Maxwell, and uh, del mu f mu nu is 0, and del mu f twiddle mu nu is 0. Okay, so these are the coupled Einstein Maxwell equations. Okay, in the absence of any charge sources, which would also contribute not not just to the electromagnetic field, but they would also gravitate. Okay. Okay, so when we say that there is rotational symmetry, rotational symmetry means again that in at least 3 plus 1D, there is an SO3 algebra of killing vector fields, okay, which are resuming. Okay, so there are killing vector fields J i, J j, uh, J k, which satisfy this kind of property, and secondly, uh, this is zero by definition since there are killing vector fields. Okay, G under diffeomorphism by these killing vector fields does not change, but also, your because we're looking for solutions to Einstein Maxwell's equations, which are rotation symmetric. The electric and magnetic fields uh, should also have the same symmetry. Okay, that is under rotation, the electric and magnetic fields should not change. Okay, so that also means that L J I F is zero, and L J I F twiddle is zero. Okay, so we're looking for solutions in this class. That's what we mean when we say we're looking for solutions with rotational symmetry. Okay. Of course, it's much easier to see once we get, um, once we write down an explicit set of coordinates, okay. So, uh, we will write down the metric, okay. So, I'll just write down the answer to the metric that we get. So, the metric that we get is of this form. So, on general grounds, just from rotational symmetry, we know that it will be of the form e to the 2 alpha rt, okay, dt square plus e to the 2 beta dr square r square d omega square okay so rotational symmetry guarantees there will be a set of theta phi coordinates okay for which the metric this part of the metric will take this form okay and we've argued bef uh, more generally okay that the metric will be will be in this form just by assuming rotational symmetry if you in addition assume that you're in pure vacuum okay then you get the schwarzschild solution and this uh, and you also get another thing for free which is alpha rt and beta rt become independent of t, okay, and uh, you get a new killing vector field, which is your time translation symmetry. Uh, it turns out in this case also something similar happens, okay. Uh, even though there are electric and magnetic fields present, the solution, okay, will look like this. Uh, so, ds square, Reisner Nordstrom, is equal to minus delta, uh, which is only a function of r dt square plus delta inverse, which is only a function of r dr square plus r square d omega square, where this function delta r uh, turns out to be 1 minus 2 gm by r plus g times q square plus p square over r square. Okay. Now, at this level, m, q, and p are only uh, constants of integration. Okay. When I solve the Einstein-Maxwell equations, these are some constants of integration that emerge. Now, we have written them in this very suggestive way because they will have the interpretation of being mass, electric charge, and magnetic charge. Okay. Uh, and how, uh, how, how will we compute that? Well, for example, we can compute the Komar integral. Okay. So, once we know this metric, we also know that it has a killing vector field k, which is equal to partial partial t, which is a time like killing vector field. Once we have this time like vector, uh, killing vector field, you can compute the Komar integral, okay, which we had written down as er, uh, which was something like n mu, sigma nu, uh, del mu, k nu integral uh, over a two dimensional boundary at spatial infinity. 
over some S2 at spatial infinity. One over some something like 8 pi g or 4 pi g, I don't remember, okay. So some constant, okay. So once you have this, you can compute ER and what you would find is for this metric, okay, this would work out to be exactly M, okay. So that is why we have written M over here because that M has the interpretation of being the mass, okay, of this, uh, uh, of the system. Okay, so this is the metric uh, and then the other thing that we need to write down is when we solve these equations, we need to write down what F, uh, the F's are. So it turns out that with this metric, you get FRT, okay, as the only non-zero component of, uh, the only non-zero components of F are FRT and F theta phi, okay, and uh, this is Q over R square. Uh, okay, uh, uh, so, uh, let me just write down one more thing. So the interpretation of this quantity is that this is the radial electric field, okay, ER, and the radial magnetic field is not exactly this, it is not exactly F theta phi, in spherical coordinates it turns out that you have to divide by something like R square sine theta to get the radial magnetic field, okay. And once you do that, the radial magnetic field works out to be just P over R square. Okay, so you see that if I look at this, okay, so let me just first state a few properties and then I'll say why Q and P therefore have the interpretation of being the electric charge and the magnetic charge, okay. It might seem obvious but, but there's something else that needs to be clarified uh, before we say this. Okay, so first I'll write down a few properties of, of the solution that we found. One is that our solution is asymptotically flat. As r goes to infinity, okay. As r goes to infinity, this delta r just approaches one, okay. All those terms are suppressed because there's a constant divided by r or r square. So this just becomes a flat metric, okay. Flat Minkowski space metric. Second is just like in Schwarzschild, okay, we only demanded rotational symmetry, but we got another symmetry for free, which is our space time is uh, stationary, okay, and that partial partial t is a time like Killing vector field as r goes to infinity, okay, but also our space time is static. Okay, and one way to see this is that I have this reflection symmetry, t goes to minus t does not change, uh, uh, ch change the metric, okay. Uh, and third is if we evaluate the Coman integral, And the Coman integral is defined because we have this time like killing vector field as R goes to infinity. Uh, then we will get that ER is just M, okay. So this parameter M that is in our metric has the interpretation of being the mass or mass energy of our configuration. And secondly, we can evaluate the charge. Uh, we can evaluate the charge using electric and magnetic um, integrals. And if you recall, we only have to use the fields at infinity, okay, to define the electric charge and the magnetic charge. And at infinity, the metric looks Minkowski. And the electric fields and magnetic fields look exactly like you would expect for a static electric charge or magnetic charge present in your system, okay. So, so if you calculate the charge using electric and magnetic integrals, Q will, you will get the electric charge Q to be just exactly that Q which is over there, 
okay and uh, and p will be the magnetic curves okay that is i work out this integral uh, let me call it i for the, uh, let me call it uh, p small e for the electric charge uh, and that integral looks something like um, f mu nu n mu sigma nu using the spatial metric on the two sphere at infinity okay and this is just going to give you uh, your uh, just q okay so that's why q has the interpretation of being the electric charge and uh, the fourth property which i'll write down over here is that if i set q equal to p equal to 0 okay then we recover the schwarzschild solution which is good because that's what we'd expect right if we turn off the electric and magnetic fields you just had rotational symmetry and we know that there is a unique solution which is the Schwarzschild solution. So if I set q equal to p equal to 0, delta just becomes 1 minus 2 gm by r and I get the Schwarzschild solution. Okay, now of course the most interesting feature will be that we have horizons, okay, if we extend the solution all the way. So this is valid locally assuming there is vacuum, okay. But now we assume that the solution could, we go on following this from r goes to infinity, we try to go on extending the solution down to lower and lower values of r, okay. And we assume that the solution is, continues to be valid, that is we assume that there are no charge sources present. Just like in Schwarzschild, we assume that there is pure vacuum, okay, there is there's no matter or energy present, except for the gravitational field, okay. Okay, so now let us understand uh, the singularities and horizons associated with the solution. Okay, so one is that there will be a true curvature singularity. as r goes to 0, okay. And the way you can uh, check this is by computing some kind of curvature invariant uh, like this Kreshman scalar, okay. And you can see that this quantity uh, will diverge as r goes to 0, okay, just like you do for Schwarzschild. However, the horizon structure is more complicated than Schwarzschild. Okay. So if you remember our way to diagnose where the horizon is, we said that we will look at, we will choose a convenient set of coordinates, okay, whenever we write down a matrix, such that partial, partial r okay will sorry, partial partial r no sorry not partial partial r yeah okay so we we talked about the tilting of the light cones right and we said that the diagnosis that we'll use is when grr of r theta phi this will go to 0 okay at some critical value of r okay so that is some r is equal to rh for all theta phi this will go to 0 okay and if that happens, okay, then uh, at those uh, places in the metric, the coordinate r will transition from being space-like to becoming time-like, okay, where delta will switch signs, okay. So, so those places will allow us to define some uh, a horizon for these black holes, okay. So we have made such a clever choice of coordinates where since grr only depends on small r, it does not depend on theta phi at all. For all theta phi, it is automatically guaranteed that at some values of r, grr will switch sign, okay, and you will find a horizon. Okay, so just remember this form of the metric, okay, or maybe I will just write it up here in, in 
small is minus delta dt square plus delta inverse dr square plus r square d omega square and delta is 1 minus 2 gm by r plus q square g times q square plus p square r square. Okay, so what we are interested in is when does this go to 0 and g upper rr is equal to delta, okay, because I have to invert this component of the metric, this is g lower rr, okay. So when this, so this goes to 0 when delta r is equal to 0, uh, identifies a horizon. So if I write out this expression for delta r, okay, so delta r can be written as 1 by r square times a quadratic which looks like this r square minus 2 gm plus g into q square plus p square. Okay, and since so this is a quadratic, it can be written as a product of, uh, of roots r minus r plus into r minus r minus. And these roots are real provided that the discriminant of this quadratic is positive, okay. So uh, these roots, let's, let's write down what r plus and r minus are, r plus r minus. Uh, so we can just look at it here, okay, we apply the quadratic formula b plus minus b square uh, minus 4ac by 2. Okay, so r plus minus is gm Okay, so what we want to do is we want to plot this delta r as a function of r, okay. And we will do it for several different cases depending on whether or not this quadratic has real roots, it has one root or it whether it has two roots, okay. So, so we will plot for three different cases. Case 1 is when, uh, let me call this the discriminant, so the discriminant is g square m square minus g times q square plus p square. Okay, so case 1 is when the discriminant is negative, uh, which means that g m square is less than q square plus p square. Okay, so this case is called the super extremal solution. Uh, I'll explain why we have these names okay, later. Uh, for now, just note that it's called the super extremal solution. The quadratic has no roots. Case two is where d is equal to zero and gm square is equal to q square plus p square, okay, which is called the extremal solution. In this case, the quadratic has a repeated root, okay, because the discriminant is 0, both roots are the same. And case 3 is d greater than 0, uh, which corresponds to gm square greater than q square plus p square. This is called sub extremal. Okay, and uh, there are two distinct roots. Okay, in this case, uh, in the case where you have a repeated root, the roots are at r plus is equal to r minus is equal to when this discriminant is zero, the root is just gm. 
in the case when you have distinct roots, one of the roots is smaller which I have denoted as r minus. So, r minus will be equal to g m plus minus square root of g square m square minus g into q square plus p square. Okay, sorry, minus this. Okay, and r plus will be g m plus this. And in this case, we are assuming that this thing is well, def I mean, is a real number, okay. So, this number will be less than gm. And the, if you see the maximum amount, okay, the largest this can be is when q square plus p square is 0, in which case r minus tends to 0. So, r minus always lies between 0, okay, and gm, okay. And r plus will lie between uh, of course, it will be greater than r minus, okay, but it will be less than the maximum value of this is again when q square plus p square is 0. So, the maximum value is 2 g, okay. So, now let us plot delta of r versus r for each of these three cases. So, delta of r uh, versus r, where delta of r is 1 by r square times that quadratic which we have written down. Okay, so if I plot delta of r versus r, it looks like this. So in the case where the quadratic, so one important thing is delta of r as r goes to infinity is 1, okay, as r goes to infinity is 1. So in all cases, you will end up here, okay, it will asymptote towards 1. As r goes to 0, in all cases, delta will uh, will blow up. As r goes to 0, this term dominates and delta of r will approach uh, in plus infinity. So, delta of r approaches plus infinity here. In the case where, case 1, okay, where the quadratic has no roots, this will never, this curve will never intersect the x axis, okay. So, therefore, it will look something like this, okay, over here, quadratic divided by 1 by r square, okay. Uh, so, this is case 1. In case 2, okay, where the discriminant is 0 and you have one real root, the curve will just intersect the real axis at one point. Okay, and this is asymptote towards 1. So, this is case 2. And case 3 is where you will intersect the axis twice. Okay, so it will look something like this. So, if you look at these roots, in you only have roots in the case 2 and case 3. Okay, for case 2, the root is at r is equal to gm. Sorry, I should label this axis. And for case 3, we have two roots which are at r minus and r plus, okay. r minus is less than gm, r plus is greater than gm. Sorry, uh, yeah, uh, I should have mentioned r plus is not just greater than r minus, it is also greater than gm, okay, because you are adding something positive, okay. And you have one very specific case where uh, q and p go to 0. Okay. In the case where QP goes to 0, you would say, well, okay, it looks like this case, okay, but that is actually, a, uh, it actually turns out to be a, a limiting case where this approach is 1, okay, but it goes like this. And the reason is when Q and P go to 0, okay, you do not have this term at all. So, there is no growth towards large positive for small r, this is not the term that dominates, rather it is this term that dominates, okay, and you go to minus infinity, okay, so it goes down to minus infinity. And the intersection with this axis is, uh, this is the case, so this orange one is the case where q is equal to p is equal to 0, okay, in which case you get the Schwarzschild solution and this intersection with the axis is at r is equal to 2gm. 
Okay, so let us discuss the nature of the solution, ok. Uh, we will draw the conformal diagram so that we understand the causal uh, structure and the global structure of each space time, but there are several different cases to consider. So, let us uh, uh, go case by case. So, first we will look at case 1, ok, which is the super extremal uh, Reiser Nordstrom, uh, Reiser Nordstrom black hole. Uh, in which case g m square is less than q square plus p square, ok. And you see that delta is positive all the way down to r is equal to 0, ok. At r is equal to 0 you have a singularity. The fact that delta never hits 0 means that you do not have an event horizon, which means that you are going to have a naked singularity, ok, in this case. So, uh, in this case there is no killing horizon. Okay, but r is equal to 0 is a naked singularity. Okay, so if you draw the Penrose diagram, uh, the Penrose diagram will look very similar to Minkowski space, okay. So it will have the same conformal boundary as Minkowski space because of course this space is asymptotically flat. This will be sky plus, this will be sky minus, this will be i 0. Okay, but now r is equal to 0 will be a singularity. Inside the metric is not Minkowski, okay, it is only asymptotically Minkowski, okay, but I can still draw the r as constant curves. So the r as constant curves will look like this. Uh, sir. Yeah. Uh, why do you say that there, there, there should not be any killing horizon? We know that, uh, from this we see that there is not going to be any apparent horizon. But what do you mean by apparent horizon? Uh, I mean event horizon. There is no, 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 there is no killing horizon, ok. So, for a killing horizon to form, partial partial t must become a null vector somewhere. right. Uh, it has to become a null vector and it has to become a null vector on a null hypersurface, ok. The condition that delta is 0 is delta is basically the norm of partial partial t, right. So, the condition that delta is 0 means that partial partial t never becomes null. So, since it never becomes null, there is no, uh, there is no killing horizon also. Yeah, the argument for uh, this GRR was an argument that we made in some specific choice of coordinate system where we are looking at the tilting of the light cones, ok, where, where we assume that we are choosing such a coordinate system such that you can do this, ok. So, now there is uh, something interesting about the solution, ok. If I look at free falling particles, uh, free falling geodesics, uh, time like geodesics. Then you can show that they, they uh, uh, starting at some r greater than 0, ok, are repelled from the singularity. Ok, that is if you start over here and you go in free fall, ok. So, for some time you will go to towards smaller r and then your trajectory will turn around. Okay, so free fall will look like this. Okay, so this will actually be a time-like geodesic. So time-like geodesics will actually never intersect the origin, which means if you allow yourself to be in gravitational free fall in the space-time, you will actually get repelled away from the singularity. Okay, however, you can accelerate. Okay, that is, you can choose not to follow a geodesic. Instead, you can accelerate, and it is possible then to reach the singularity. Okay, by by not not following geodesic mode. Also, null geodesics can obviously reach here because null geodesics will travel at 45 degrees. So, null geodesics can reach here, accelerating observers, ok, who are also time like observers can reach here, ok. So, accelerating time like observers, time like trajectories or null trajectories.
can reach the singularity. Okay, so you have a naked singularity, but this doesn't violate the cosmic censorship conjecture because the singularity exists for all times. Okay, it's not resulting from the collapse of matter. But you could ask a question, can such a singularity form from the collapse of matter? Okay, can such a singularity form from the collapse of matter? And let me give you an intuitive reason why this would never form, okay. Intuitively, the condition g m square less than q square plus p square is a statement that in some sense this is a measure of the total energy of the whole. And uh, this is like, imagine it's like self gravitational energy. And this energy is its total electromagnetic energy. Okay, I'm just giving a heuristic argument. And now what we're saying is that the total energy of the black hole, including its electromagnetic energy, okay, is less than the electromagnetic energy. The only way that could happen is if the mass energy that's falling in is negative, okay, and that would violate some energy condition. So under assumptions of certain energy conditions, okay, you will never get a black hole to form, okay, if, if you assume your, 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 the density of things that is collapsing is a positive energy density, then it can never happen that you violate this condition, okay, or that Q square plus P square can be greater than GM square, okay. This should never happen, okay, because this energy accounts for everything, electromagnetic as well as other stuff. So the only way this can happen is if the other stuff has negative energy. So it, it makes sense that this singularity is unphysical. So under the assumption of certain energy conditions, you will never form a naked singularity of this kind. Okay, the other thing is that this uh, space time has no Cauchy slices, okay, because any Cauchy slice that you try to draw will end on the singularity at which your initial conditions are completely undetermined. Okay, you don't even know how to treat the initial conditions uh, at the singularity. Okay. Sir, oh, yeah. Just uh, one question, like for this case, when gm square is less than q square plus uh, p square, uh, is it right to call this space time a black hole? Because uh, as there is no hor event horizon, so I mean, no such points which are like, uh, as in the case of Rothschild, which are uh, different from these points, which. Yeah. So is it right to call it a black hole? Yeah, so in fact, okay, uh, the definition that we gave for a black hole, okay, which is that there's a singularity and there's an event horizon. Okay, you could take that as a definition, but it's not necessary that you take it as a definition. Okay, the true thing in GR, the only things which are well defined are the existence of singularities and the existence of event horizons, which separate the singularity from asymptotic observers. Do they necessarily have to occur together? Not necessarily in the case when you have naked singularities. Okay, but typically for naked singularities to form, uh, and so whether you call that a black hole or not is a, um, is a matter of choice, okay. So typically people don't call that a black hole, they just say it's a naked singularity. But the reason why people don't talk about these naked singularities is because you don't expect them to form in nature, okay, from ordinary collapsing matter. So there's a conjecture on the forms of energy density that you can have so that cosmic censorship is, is protected, okay, and that any time you have a singularity, an event horizon uh, will, will form. Are these conjectures true? We don't know, okay. But if they are true, it means that singularities will always form with event horizons, in which case a black hole, on, I mean only f well, uh, black holes that make sense to talk about are singularities with event horizons. Okay, so now let's come to the actually more interesting case. Before we go to case 2, let's jump to case 3 which is more generic, where you have two solutions, okay, rather than just one solution. So case 2 is gm square greater than q square plus p square, okay. So in a realistic collapse, you would expect this to be true, okay. That is the total mass energy is greater than the electromagnetic energy, okay, associated with the black hole. So this is expected to be the more generic scenario. But in fact, for astrophysical black holes, okay, they, they will discharge very quickly because if you have a large negative charge, 
immediately it will pull in positive charges and, and discharge very quickly, okay. So, real astrophysical black holes we do not expect will have uh, much uh, you know will have a significant charge to begin with and this condition will always be true Q square. So, first of all we have never discovered magnetic monopole. So, you will only have a Q for astrophysical black holes and this Q will be very small if any for any typical astrophysical black hole, okay. So, these solutions are more uh, sort of in interesting when we start study toy models of, of GR in, in very specific scenarios. But, but this is the scenario that is expected for any generic gravitational collapse expected in any realistic gravitational collapse. Whether or not this charge Q is, is small uh, as long as it is much smaller than gm square. And now, if we plot R, okay, so we have a singularity at R is equal to 0. We have R minus, we have R plus, and, uh, uh, and yeah, and then we have this region beyond R plus, okay. Now, in the region beyond R plus, delta will be positive, okay, the quadratic will be positive. In the region between R minus and R plus, delta will be negative. And again, once I cross over uh, uh, from R minus to uh, to this region, again delta will be positive. Okay. So what does that mean? It means over here R is a space-like coordinate, but here R is going to be a time-like coordinate. So, crossing R plus will be just like crossing the Schwarzschild horizon, okay, where uh, R switches to being a, from a space like to a time like coordinate. So, there is a coordinate singularity at uh, R plus and R minus, okay, but the solution is valid uh, both to the left or to the right of R minus, uh, of R plus and R minus, okay. So, the solution continues to be valid just like in the Schwarzschild case, the solution was valid piecewise, okay, this solution can also be thought to be valid in various patches, okay. You can write down the solution here, you can write down the solution here and you can write down the solution in this feature, okay. But those are different coordinate patches, you do not, you do not treat it as one continuous coordinate patch, okay. So, in this region again R will be space like. Okay, and of course, T then switches roles, so T here is time like. T here is space like and T here is again time like. Okay, and R plus and R minus, these are only coordinate singularities. Okay, if you compute the curvature as you approach these points, the curvature is finite. Okay, these points are only coordinate singularities. And the coordinates t r theta phi are uh, all valid in each patch wise, okay, in each patch, okay, either in this patch, this patch or this patch, okay. So, I will just directly sketch the conformal diagram, okay, of this, uh, of this space time and then we will try to understand its structure. So, the first thing is that there will be an asymptotic Minkowski like region, so it will be scry plus scry minus i 0, okay. And at some point, so this this will correspond to the uh, this third patch, okay, where r is greater than r plus, okay. And then at some point, we will hit the horizon at r plus, okay. So, r plus will be horizon. Since it is a horizon, it is going to be a null, uh, uh, a null surface. So, R plus will be a null surface. Remember we have rotational symmetry. So, every point in this diagram is again in S2, okay. So, every point is in S2. So, there will be an R plus over here, okay. Similarly, in the past, there will be an R plus coordinate, okay, which will be like the white hole singularity, okay. Uh, sorry, white hole event horizon and this will be like a black hole event horizon. Now, once we cross over into this region of R plus, okay, then R switches from being a space-like coordinate to becoming a time-like coordinate. So, now you are forced to move 
towards regions okay, where R decreases because as time passes R is the thing that changes, R is a measure of time now okay, and just like in the Schwarzschild case you move towards smaller values of R. Okay. In this case unlike Schwarzschild, in the Schwarzschild case you cross over at 2 gm okay, and immediately in time you end up hitting the singularity. Okay. As time passes now you do not hit the singularity but rather you hit a null, another null surface okay. and this other null surface is at R minus. So this other null surface that when you cross over that you hit is going to be at R minus. Okay. So this is the surface with uh, R is so this is the surface R is equal to R plus, R is equal to R plus, so R is infinity and this surface is R is equal to R minus. Okay. And again there will be two such surfaces R is equal to R minus. Okay. So you, you can hit this or this surface, okay. these are the R is equal to R minus surfaces. Okay. And when you try to, when you try to do this extension, okay, you find that once again you have this mirror universe. Okay. So you have this mirror parallel universe with its own scry plus and scry minus. Okay, there is going to be an R is equal to R plus for this universe okay, and there will be an R is equal to R plus for this patch okay, and once again for this mirror universe there will be these regions with R is equal to R minus, R is equal to R minus. Okay. So now if you look at what happened okay, when we cross over from R universe past this horizon we enter this region between R plus and R minus. Okay, we enter this region between R plus and R minus in which case you are forced to move towards uh, R minus. As time passes you are moving R is now a spatial uh, sorry as a time like coordinate as time passes R decreases okay, and you move from R plus to R minus. Okay, that your time coordinate changes by that much. Now there is a question of what happens when you cross here. Okay, when you cross here, when you cross here Okay, you have two choices. Now R is a space like coordinate. Okay. So now it is not necessary that you have to move towards decreasing values of R. You can make a choice. Okay. You do, do I want to accelerate and move this way or do I want to move in the opposite direction okay, towards R is 0. Now it is a spatial coordinate. Now R is a spatial coordinate. If I choose to move towards R is equal to 0, I will encounter the singularity. Okay. The singularity is now at a spatial point. Okay. It is not at a time like surface. Like in, uh, like in the Schwarzschild case, it is not a singularity that you are going to reach in time. This is, a, this is a singularity that you reach in space. Okay. So this singularity will look something like this. It will be here at R is equal to 0. Okay. This will be here at R is equal to 0. Okay. So you can, you can choose to approach it or you can choose to go away from it okay, depending on, uh, on how you accelerate. If I choose to go away from it, okay, then once again I will cross this boundary at R minus which will be an event horizon. Okay. But now this R minus that I cross okay, is not going to be the same R minus that I entered from. Okay. It will be a different R minus which is over here. Okay. So when I cross this region, Okay, if I choose not to go this way but I choose to come back towards R minus, I am going into the future. Okay. So since I am going into the future, this is not the same R minus that I started from, I am going into a future R minus okay, and that is going to be somewhere here. Okay. So now I enter a different part of the space time okay, and once I enter over here, now in this region, okay, uh, when, I, when I cross over from this region into this region. Now again R will be a time like coordinate and R will be a time like coordinate in such a way that as time passes into the future R increases from R minus to R plus. Okay. So now I am forced okay, to increase my R coordinate and move towards R plus which will be again an event horizon, sorry uh, a killing horizon. Okay. And then once I cross over into this region of R plus, okay, then once again it sorry, then it just basically looks like this all over again. Okay. So then once again I have scry plus, scry plus, scry minus, okay, scry minus, 
okay and uh, basically this pattern repeats okay so again here we'll have a similarity r is r minus r is r minus okay and uh, okay so this pattern goes on repeating indefinitely you can go on crisscrossing in infinite number of times okay but every time you cross from r plus to r minus and from r minus you cross back towards r minus at a future time okay you will end up in a different patch of the universe okay you can either end up in a different patch or if you choose to move towards the singularity you will end up in the singularity okay where gr breaks down okay but but in principle that is the valid mathematical solution okay so any of these are these are all valid time like trajectories okay either i can just continue on this infinite journey okay where i go from one patch of the universe to another and now if you think about this this is really like a wormhole which is traversable okay you don't have to be an observer traveling at the speed of light to get from this patch to that patch which are different uh, parts of the universe okay you can actually just cross this horizon a black hole like horizon and come out from a white hole like horizon and now you're in a different patch of the universe okay okay and uh, if i draw the r is equal to constant lines uh, for example here these are the r is equal to constant lines Uh, and here the r is equal to constant lines uh, are these so that you're moving from r is equal to r plus to r is equal to r minus as you go into the future okay uh, so this is starting at r is equal to r plus and ending at r is equal to r minus and similarly here now r is a spatial coordinate okay just like the case with the naked singularity you can end up directly hitting the singularity or you can go away from the singularity okay uh, if you choose to go away then you enter into and then you can you'll cross another white hole horizon where you'll emerge into this parallel universe so this region outside of the black hole there are an infinite number of copies okay and you can access all of them in principle okay by following certain time like trajectory okay and just like with schwarzschild you can derive all of this much more rigorously like like a schwarzschild you don't use the tr theta phi you switch to this kruskal zeckeris coordinates which can be maximally extended you can do something similar here okay we're just arguing this in the same way that we did for schwarzschild by looking at various coordinate patches okay now uh, one thing that i should mention is that this solution is unlikely to be uh, realistic to apply to the real world okay even if you had a charged black hole and the reason is that if you look at any observer who's crossing into these infinite patches as they go into this region for example okay they can now receive light signals okay from everywhere inside this minkowski patch okay so everywhere inside this minkowski patch they are constantly receiving signals okay and these signals are all unlike the signals which get sent out of this uh, black hole which are red shifted as they approach sky plus these signals which enter the black hole okay or this across this event horizon are actually blue shifted okay so they become higher in energy and all these infinitely blue shifted signals seem start approaching this okay surface over here and they start piling up okay and so when you have a large energy density piling up okay so even if i have a small perturbation once it reaches here it's a very large energy density and that large en energy density can have a back reaction on the metric okay which means if i perturb this metric slightly the metric here will be significantly altered okay so even though I, it's a small change outside the black hole inside the black hole there can be significant changes okay so what is the new geometry look like when you perturb this it's not completely clear it's not clear whether you'll have a singularity or not okay but one thing that people seem to think should be true is that you will still have these kind of traversable wormholes where you are connected from one patch to another patch okay and you can just go th go through all the way okay let me do the last case case 
of uh, extremal black holes. Okay, where gm square is equal to q square plus p square. Okay, so this is an uh, this is an interesting toy model. Okay, uh, which is often used in when people are studying effects in quantum gravity. Uh, it's unlikely to be a very realistic case. Okay, if you add any little bit of matter which satisfies some positive energy conditions, okay, then immediately gm square will become larger than q square plus p square, and you'll go back to k state. Okay, so this is un unlikely to be a stable solution, but it's a very very interesting toy solution to general relativity, okay, or to the Einstein-Maxwell equations. So in this case, uh, we've seen that R is equal to zero will be a singularity. R is infinity, you'll approach Minkowski spacetime. But at R is equal to GM, okay, you will cross over from a region where R is space-like directly into a region again where R is space-like. What has actually happened is if you imagine that you slowly, slowly increase your q square plus p square, okay, increase the charge without increasing the mass, then the solution switches to the point where r plus and r minus merge, okay, into a single solution over here to the quadratic of gm, which means to the right of r plus, which is now this point, r is space-like, to the left of it, again, r is space-like, okay. So you don't have any region at all where r is going to be time-like. So if I uh, draw the Penrose diagram, okay, for this solution, it, it's going to look something like this. R is equal to zero will be your singularity. Okay, here I will have uh, a patch of Minkowski spacetime, sky plus, sky minus. This is the horizon, R is equal to R plus. When I cross over into this region, now again I have a choice. Do I go on towards R is equal to zero? or do I come back out towards r is equal to r plus, uh, sorry, r is equal to rh, okay. Sorry, instead of r plus, I should call this rh, okay. So do I cross over into this region or do I come back out? If I choose to come back out, I'm going to cross r is equal to rh, but I will cross it at a future time. So it won't be this horizon that I cross, but rather a different horizon at r is equal to rh, okay. And once again, I will encounter a new patch of Minkowski spacetime. Okay, over here, and this pattern will repeat uh, re again and again and again. Okay. So in this case, it's not a naked singularity. Okay, it's a singularity with a horizon, but the horizon is interesting because it doesn't take you from from a p where a coordinate where r is space-like to r is time-like, but rather r is space-like on both sides of this horizon. So there's a different type of horizon. It's not necessary. So there's still a null hypersurface, but on both sides, R is a space-like coordinate. Okay, so now what's special about this uh, extremal black hole? Okay, so the remarkable thing is, that when the charge and mass are equal, okay, in, th in this manner, then the, if I have two such black holes, okay, and let's treat them for the moment as if we're doing Newtonian gravity, okay. Let's say that these two black holes are at some separation r, okay, in Newtonian gravity. Okay, then they will be mutually gravitationally attracting, okay, so they, this will be the force of gravity and because they have the same charge, okay, we will assume they have the same sign of the charge, they will also have a repulsive electromagnetic interaction, okay. So if we work out, so let us assume that they have the same QM, same QM, okay, sorry, uh, they can be different, okay, sorry, this is Q1, M1. So is Q2, M2. But the important point is that Q and M are related, okay, by that relationship for an extremal black hole, okay. So I'm just going to consider electric charge for the moment. So G M M1 square is equal to Q1 square and G M2 square equals Q2 square, okay. Or 
I will just drop the g for the moment and write it as m1 is equal to q1, m2 is equal to q2. Okay. So, now the point is that for an extremal black hole where the mass and charge are equal, the uh, uh, force of attraction due to gravity will exactly balance the counter force due to Coulombic repulsion. Okay. So, this configuration will actually be stable. So, you will you'll be able to just set up black holes which are at any distance from each other and they will be perfectly stable okay. because their gravity which is attracting them will exactly balance the uh, Coulomb repulsion. Okay. So, they will stay at exactly the same place and I can put any number of black holes okay, not just two black holes for every pair okay, the Coulomb attraction will I mean there is pairwise interaction the pairwise interactions all cancel out. Okay. So, there is no net uh, movement of uh, this configuration of extremal black holes. Okay. Now, this analysis is all done you know with some Newtonian approximation, but you can make this more rigorous. So, let me just write it out quickly. Okay. So, if we make it more rigorous, we will just write down the metric first. So, in the case where q square plus p square is equal to gm square, this delta just becomes in the extremal case, okay, it just becomes 1 minus uh, gm by r whole square. Okay, this, this becomes a perfect square. So, when you, when you write this metric now, it is 1 minus gm by r whole square dt square plus 1 minus gm by r whole square dr square plus r square d square. Okay, and now what you can do is you can define a shifted radial coordinate. Okay, so you can define a new coordinate rho, which is equal to r minus g m. Okay, and then you can write this metric using this rho as uh, h to the minus two rho d t square plus h square rho d rho square plus uh, d rho square plus rho square d rho square. Okay, so, you, you can check this where h of rho is equal to uh, 1 plus g m by rho. Okay, so, I will just read it in this metric under the shifted coordinate r minus g m. Okay, so, rho if you think about what rho is, we are just taking, we, uh, okay, and we are going to write down the solution only out exterior to the black holes. Okay. So, exterior to all the extremal black holes, we are going to be working this region where rho is greater than g m. Okay. So, rho parameterizes the distance from the black hole horizon. Okay. Rho is, rho is, rho goes to 0 means I am approaching the black hole horizon. Okay, so, now what you can do is you can switch coordinates. Okay. So, your rho theta phi for rho not equal to 0, that is as long as I am outside of this horizon okay, or for rho greater than 0. If I look at this, this looks my, like my flat space coordinates. Okay, this just looks like my flat space coordinates. So, I can rewrite it as an x, y, z coordinate okay, just using flat coordinates. So, if I do that, uh, then this metric can now be written okay, as this is 1 plus g m by rho is like a radial coordinate. So, this is by mod x. Okay. Remember that, but as x goes to 0, rho goes to 0 and that is not really uh, just a point in space time, but rather now you are reaching the horizon okay, of a black hole okay, as, as x goes to 0. So, uh, this is this solution is valid ev everywhere for uh, rho greater than 0 or mod x greater than 0. Okay. And our metric can be written as minus h to the minus 2 rho uh, sorry of mod x d t square plus h square mod x uh, d x i square sum over i.
okay. So, it just looks like flat space coordinates with this modification by this factor of h of x. Okay, so I won't write down the uh, how you, how you do this, but uh, there is a generalization of this. Okay, so this describes one black hole. Describes one extremal black hole with q equal to m, or okay, or q square equal to g m. So p square plus p q square equal to g m. But it is possible, okay, to now write down a solution of many such black holes, okay, with, of many such black holes, and all you have to do, okay, so this, generalization to many extremal black holes is h of x is equal to 1 plus g m x minus x uh, not uh, uh, x minus x bar j. Okay. So, where each black hole, where the event horizon of each black hole is located at x equal to x j. At x at this vector position. Okay, so the point of x j is not actually singularity. Okay, again, each point x j, the metric looks singular, but it's actually a coordinate singularity. Okay, and every time you cross into that region where x is equal to x j, okay, you are basically going to reach a, a new region of space-time, which is behind the event horizon of that particular extremal black hole. Now, the remarkable thing is that this generalization. Okay, sorry, there is a sum over j, okay, and I can have any number of black holes, n can be any number, okay, and this is a solution to the Einstein Maxwell equations, okay. So, the claim is this is a solution to the Einstein Maxwell equation, this is a solution to Einstein Maxwell. Okay, you can see the proof in Carroll. Okay, it's not it's not very complicated, uh, and so this is rather remarkable. Okay, it's you have an exact solution to Einstein's equations. Okay, where you put in many many objects, not just one black hole, which is a difficult solution to obtain by itself, but now you have a solution where I can put in many black holes. Okay, and because of this extremal nature, okay, where the mass and charge are equal, uh, these black holes. Uh, can remain static. They can remain where they are, okay, without repelling each other or attracting each other. They just stay where they are. So, the event horizons remain at fixed x j coordinates, okay. So, this is really a, a quite a remarkable toy solution and this is used very often, okay, when doing toy problems in quantum gravity. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we'll stop here. Any questions? Just one question, like when you uh, describe that Newtonian part, like, uh, like if g is not equal to zero, like we know that the Newtonian constant and the Coulomb constant are not the same, right? So, sorry, I mean the Newtonian force is g m1 m2 by r squared, and the Coulomb force is uh, one over the constant of the thing. Yeah, I should be clear. We're actually okay. All of this is using some Gaussian units, okay. So, in these units, the Coulombic force is just q square by r square, okay, uh, or q1, q2 by r square, okay. And the gravitational force is m1, m2, g m1, m2 by r square, okay. So, uh, for, for if you are saying that these two balance, okay, at some r, what we are saying is that g uh, square root g m1 times square root g m2 is equal to q1 q2 okay and if this is equal to q1 and this is equal to q2 for extremal black holes okay then these forces balance i am not sure about this but i think that this mass 
of each extremal black hole can be different as long as each one's mass and charge are the same, okay. Yeah, that's right. I think, I think each one can have a different mass as long as it's, it's separately an extremal black hole, okay. Because we don't need m1 to be equal to m2. We just need m1 equal to q1, okay, up to this factor of square root g and we need m2 equal to q2. Okay, so this is called the uh, multi-extremal black hole metric. Multi-extremal solution. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if not, we'll stop here and we'll meet on Friday.